All right, let's go to our sermon hour, our preaching time. Last week, I announced what we'd be preaching on, or so I thought, and yet the last several days, I was thinking of my mom, and I realized this is Mother's Day, and I never wanted to be some preacher who just follows the calendar. We have to preach on groundhogs because it's Groundhog's Day, right? I never wanted to be like that because everybody does that. However, I, I couldn't shake the, the thoughts out of my mind, and so I figured maybe the Lord wants us to talk about it. Um, so since today is Mother's Day here in the U.S., we're going to talk about mothers. And uh, if the Lord allows, we'll go back to the previously announced topic next Sunday. But I want you to open your Bibles right now to the book of 2 Timothy in the New Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy 1 in verses 3 through 5. The Apostle Paul writes, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with a pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembered, excuse me, I, re, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Unfeigned faith, that means it was genuine, it wasn't forced or artificial, it wasn't pretended faith, it was real. Paul said that's the kind of faith Timothy's mother had inspired in him and his grandmother as well. And he believed it was in Timothy also. He says, uh, also verse 4, Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears. Have you ever wanted something from God? Maybe some prayer request? Some person that's not saved, and you want them to come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ so strongly that you cried about it? You were broken up about it, not knowing what to do except call out to God and beg Him for it. Evidently, Timothy shed tears over the things he wanted God to do. And Paul says he got that kind of faith from his mother and his grandmother. Paul says, verse 3, he thanked God for all of that. The Bible says, children, obey your parents, both of them. In the Lord, honor thy, for this is right, honor thy father and thy mother. Ephesians 6, verses 1 and 2. May the 8th is Parents' Day in the Korean society. But uh, here in the United States, we separate them and have Father's Day and Mother's Day uh, as two separate events. And it was first observed in 1914, after it was signed into law by President Woodrow Wilson here in America. So if I calculated right, today is the 105th Mother's Day observance in the United States. So once again, let me say Happy Mother's Day to those of you who are mothers with us today. And we honor mothers and grandmothers uh, and mothers of children everywhere. At least us men do. At least we're supposed to. We'll give mothers one day of the year when they don't have to work so hard, right? We're really selfless that way. But the great French general Napoleon famously said, The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And the influence and the effect that a mother has on her children cannot be Overstated. They cannot. I was talking to our friend, Brother Del Grande. I wasn't talking, I was texting to him. You, know, you get your texting and your talking confused with each other sometimes. 
And um, it was early this morning. He's about three hours ahead of us. And he's up early going out to his job seven days a week. And um, he didn't have a good mother. He was raised in bars. His mother was a bartender. He was raised in bars. Never knew who his father was. And uh, didn't have a godly mother growing up. Before she died, he was able to lead her to the Lord, thankfully. But he didn't have a good example of a mother who really cared for him and looked out for his welfare. And um, how many people in the world could that similar story be told about? Too many. But um, one of the greatest honors anyone ever has in life, it, when they're out in public, is to point to a lady and say, this is my mom. introduce her to someone and say, this is my mother, because you're grateful in your heart for everything she did for you and everything she means to you, especially if you still have her with you. I was thinking my, when my grandmother was um, elderly and was suffering from Alzheimer, dementia and Alzheimer's, and my grandfather, rather than commit her to a, an Alzheimer's um, facility, nursing home facility. He kept her at home with him as long as he could. But you see how that, that disease wears down the other family members looking after the one who's sick. And, uh, and he told us, I'd rather have her at home this way than not have her at all. That's how every person ought to feel about their mother. One day you won't have her. And uh, I empathize with those who are fairly young in life and they've already lost their mom. That's a, a sad thing to go through. Sad thing to, to deal with and recognize. But um, one day as a little girl, she was watching her mother work around the house and do dishes, clean around the house. And she noticed some white hairs sticking out from all the other dark hair on her mom's head. And she asked, Mama, why do you have some white hairs? And of course, mother trying to motivate the girl, she said, well, honey, when you disobey, when you make me upset, I get a white hair. The girl thought, and she said, well then, how come all of grandma's hairs are white? <laughs> Paul begins by mentioning Timothy's grandmother. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois. There in verse 5. There were some children, first, second graders, long in there. And their teacher asked them to write down uh, what a grandmother is, the definition of a grandmother. Here are some of their responses were like this. A grandmother is a person who has no children of her own, she likes other people's boys and girls. <clears throat> Another one said, they're old, so they shouldn't play hard, um, and they shouldn't run. Um, usually, grandmothers are fat, but not too fat to help you tie your shoes. <clears throat> one said, grandmothers wear glasses and funny underwear. When they read a story, they don't skip the parts or, and they don't mind if it's the same story over and over again. Uh, one little boy said, everybody should try to have a grandma, a grandmother rather, uh, especially if you don't have television because they're the only uh, grown-ups who have the time. And I was, it's already been mentioned among our group here, I was blessed to have two godly grandmothers, and uh, <clears throat> my grandma Leonard was a little bit more timid and introverted. My grandma Shribe was more of an extrovert, but each one has its qualities, each one has its benefits, and they both cared about souls. They both prayed for souls and 
sought to witness to souls. And um, my, uh, my father said, my, my grandmother Shribe, he could meet a lady who had been a Roman Catholic all her life, lead her to the Lord, and within a few months, that lady would be a Catholic hater. This is how effective she was at teaching her the Word of God and discipling some ladies in the Scriptures. We need more women like that. We need more men like that. We need more Christians all around like that who see what's right and wrong and see the truth and see the error and know there's a clear difference between one and the other. And they're not afraid to point it out. <laughs> My other grandmother, on the other hand, believed all those same things. But like I say, she was a little more quiet when it came to uh, public uh, engagement. But she was a real prayer warrior and a Bible student. You know, when my grandfather and grandmother Leonard both passed away and my, my folks were sorting through their belongings, we were going through their home and uh, they had Bibles everywhere. They had Bibles all over the place. They had Bibles in the living room. These were just, you know, for company Bibles. And then they had Bibles in the bedroom on the nightstand. They had their own Bibles they would take to church. They had Bibles in the bathroom, in the magazine rack. And they had Bibles everywhere. And those Bibles were all marked. They were marked up like my father used to say, a Korean road map. <laughs> Although I've never seen one of those either. But apparently those weren't marked very well 60 years ago. But their Bibles were marked all the time. They'd, re they'd read through one, wear one out, underline, highlight, underscore, and memorize scripture. And when the Bible was falling apart and the cover is coming off, they'd go get a new Bible and do the same thing. You know, they say a Bible that is worn out is usually owned by a Christian who's not. Process that one for a minute. And just as the scripture would suggest, godly grandmothers were once godly mothers also. Paul said, and thy mother Eunice. You know, the first person who loves you is your mother. She starts loving you as soon as you're conceived and she knows that a baby's on the way. And she thinks about you before you're born. She wants to stay uh, safe and healthy so that you're born safe and healthy and have every advantage entering into life. As few sicknesses come up as uh, possible. Uh, back in 2014... Kevin Durant was the MVP in the uh, National Basketball Association. And I'm not a big basketball fan, but he right, currently plays for the Golden State Warriors. And he received the MVP award, and uh, he was giving an acceptance speech, and his mother was in the audience. And he began to talk about his childhood how that um, his mother went to bed hungry so that he and his brother didn't have to. She was his biggest supporter from the sidelines, and he was just a boy growing up practicing sports and forced him to exercise, forced him to do all those things that she hoped would pay off one day. And she did without, so he didn't have to do, do without. And he looks into the audience and he says, you're the real MVP in my life today. You can find it online. It's very inspirational. But there are several great and noble women described for us in the word of God. Moses' mother, Jochebed, protected Moses as a baby when Pharaoh gave orders to slay all the male babies among the Israelites in Egypt. We read about uh, Hannah, who prayed that God would give her a son. And the Lord gave her that son uh, to she and her husband. And after the baby boy was uh, old enough to uh, walk, I suppose, young, young boy, he'd already been weaned and so forth, she sent him to train under Eli the prophet as his assistant. And he became the prophet Samuel. 
one of the greatest prophets in Israel's history. And she said, as long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. 1 Samuel 1, verse 28. So a true godly mother never stops praying for you. She never stops worrying about you. She never stops thinking of you. She never stops hoping for the best for you and wanting the best for you, worrying about you. And so today I want to take up the subject, if I can, for the time we have uh, godly mothers in an ungodly world. Ungodly mothers in an ungodly world. Someone said, my mother taught me a number of things. She taught me to appreciate a job well done. She would say, if you're going to kill each other, go outside. I just got finished cleaning. She taught us about religion. You better pray that that stain comes out of the carpet. She taught us about time travel. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. My mother taught us about logic. Because I said so. That's why. My mother taught us about foresight. Make sure you wear clean underwear in case you're in an accident. You know, you want to be ready for those things. My mother taught us the concept of irony. You keep crying, and I'll give you something to cry about. A number of other things. But... Second Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5, say this. This know also that in the last days perilous times will come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. That entire list of, of character flaws could be applied to any number of women on television and the internet and the media today. World's filled with rabble and... Uh, subpar human beings who pass themselves off as mothers and they're raising, turning out a whole generation of misfits to turn them loose to prey upon the rest of us in society. You ever seen some of these self-absorbed self uh, people on some of these talk shows, you know, Mari Povich, you know, the DNA test results are here. Get some girl on there, they've tested 24 men, and they can't figure out who the father is of that child she had. And society doesn't mind flaunting it and celebrating it as if it's the norm. It's not the norm. It's not what any decent person wants, not even what that woman wants. But they celebrate it as though it's sad, that's no big deal. Remember that creature several years back they called Octomom? What a weirdo. Have eight children all at once, added to the six she already had, with no uh, father in the picture. Just a, That's not a mother. That's not a decent family. That's a circus act. Who knows where Octomom and her entourage are now? But um, Abraham Lincoln once said, all that I am or hope to be, I owe to my angelic mother. You live in a day and age right now where babies aren't even safe in their mother's womb before they're born. Not if she's not interested. She changes her mind. They can dispose of that baby. This is if they were taking out the trash. And uh, the world we live in is a sick place. So let me cons consider three uh, attributes of a godly mother. 
in an ungodly world. And point number one is this. Her hands are working. This little boy, uh, rather a boy, I should say, young man, got his first job. And he went off to work every day, and he came back, and someone asked what he did. Oh, sure, I go to work. What time do you get up? You know, oh, I get up about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, because it's a little bit of a drive to my job. Does anyone else get up? Oh, yeah, my mother gets up. What does she do? Well, she, she fixes my breakfast before I go and um, make sure I have lunch to take with me. Anybody else up? Yeah, Dad's up, and she's making his breakfast, too, because he has to go off to his job. Then uh, what does your mom do after that? Oh, she's probably busy cleaning our laundry and cooking, getting, getting dinner ready for us and cleaning around the house, <clears throat> doing a number of odd jobs around the, the, the number of chores and odd jobs around the house. And uh, he says, the fellow asked, do you get paid for what you do? Oh, sure, I get paid. What about your father? Does he get paid? Oh, sure, he gets paid. What about your mother? Does she get paid? Mother get paid? Why? Mother doesn't work. I want you to go to Proverbs chapter 31, the classic text on women, classic text on mothers. Proverbs 31. And rather than read all this text, let me just point out a, a few verses from this passage, highlights, I should say. But a, a godly mother's hands are working. Verse 13 says, She seeketh wool and flax, and worketh willingly with her hands. Mothers are always having to sew kids' clothes and men clothes that their little boys and girls have damaged or ripped up or torn, um, trying to keep their clothes intact until they're until they grow out of them, then they have to go out and get new clothes. Um, verse 19, she layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. Verse 22, she maketh herself covering of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Look down at verse, 14, or up at verse 14. It says, she is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. <clears throat> now, you don't have to go very far to the grocery store these days, but normally, most of the time, women do the grocery shopping at home. They buy the food for the household. They buy everything necessary for meals for that coming week. Some women prefer to do it every day, and that's even more burdensome, I would imagine, to go out every day and come back each day with enough for that meals or that night's meal. But she also does the cooking, verse 15. It says, She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meals, excuse me, giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. Verse 16 says, She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. You know, both my mom and my wife at different times have had garden, done gardening, I should say, vegetable gardens, so forth. They had green thumbs to do that. I don't have a green thumb. I planted a Korean pear tree in my backyard 10 years ago. And because of the extra rain we had this season, it's finally starting to grow. It's a nice looking tree. I got a few pieces of fruit on it last year, but never amounted to much. I'm hoping and praying, and asking God, dear God, give me some fruit on that tree this year. But if God didn't do the watering for me, it probably wouldn't have gotten watered. This is, how, this is how talented I am in gardening and horticulture. Verse 15 says, She riseth also while it is yet night. And then in verse 18, it adds, Her candle goeth not out by night. There's an old saying, a, a man works from sun to sun, but a woman's work is never done. That's very true. Wife, the mother gets up early. She's tending to the household needs, making sure food is on the table for her kids before they go to school, as my father had mentioned for us. Verse 31 says, 
shooketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth, eateth not the bread of idleness. A good mother, a godly mother, has hands that are working. Secondly, let me say this. Her mouth is speaking. And I don't mean just talking. I don't mean gossiping. But when she says something, it's profound. It's something you as a son or a daughter ought to pay attention to. You might want to remember it one day. You might want to pass it on to your own children if time, if time allows you someday. It says, she openeth her mouth with, her, with wisdom and under her tongue is the law of kindness. There in verse 26. When John Wesley was a, a student in Oxford University in the 1700s, he wrote back to his mother, Susanna Wesley, and complained about the drinking other students were engaging in and didn't know what to make of it, what to think of it. And Susanna Wesley wrote him back and said, My dear son, remember that anything which increases the authority of the body over the mind is an evil thing. That's good instruction. Anything that, here we got, we have a whole generation of people who'd rather uh, check out from reality and smoke dope and drink, uh, drink booze and uh, smoke all the pot they can sm possibly smoke and uh, think that they're going to, that's going to increase their grasp on reality. No, you're going to let go of your grasp of reality. We got enough problems with drunk drivers drinking alcohol on the highways today. Why we want people under the influence of pot driving behind the wheel? You know good and well they're going to. If they're not doing, you know, they passed, uh, they legalized pot in the state of Washington. And uh, it took two full weeks before the first hit and run driver uh, committed his crime, murdered somebody on the highway under the influence of marijuana. Two full weeks. I wonder, I'm surprised it took that long. And uh, this world has gone crazy. The society you and I live in is, as it was once said, an insane asylum being run by the inmates. And there's no rhyme or reason, there's no logic, no rational explanation for the things people are doing these days, but they want to. I have my rights. You don't have a right. I want to do it. Therefore, I have the right to do it. No, you don't. Just because you want to do it doesn't mean you have the right to do it or that you ought to do it. My grandfather used to say, if they put the same restrictions on tobacco and cigarettes that they ostensibly have on alcohol purchases, the crime rate in this country would go sky high. People breaking all kinds of laws just to get their hands on a pack of cigarettes. That's how desperate people are to depend on something rather than trust God to give them a clear mind and a sound mind and, and a, a grasp of reality. He was probably right about that. There was an, a London newspaper editor who was submitting an article on the life of Winston Churchill where all the people who had influenced Churchill, all of his instructors and teachers, and uh, Churchill um, said uh, in his list he forgot the one person who had been his most famous instructor, and that was his mother. There was a preacher famous preacher years ago, G. Campbell Morgan. He had four sons, and all of them became ministers. And someone was asking one of the sons, who is the most uh, effective preacher in the uh, Morgan household? And the son and his father looked at each other, and they both replied, Mother. Mother was the most effective, the most influential. Abraham Lincoln said, I remember my mother's prayers, and they have always followed me. They have clung to me all my life. You know, Abraham Lincoln's mother died when he was only eight years old. So the influence of a godly mother and a, a praying mother cannot be overstated or underestimated. Susanna Wesley was asked once, how did she, she raised 19 children. How was she able to be so influential on the lives of her children, especially John Wesley and Charles Wesley, who were the most well-known. And she said, by getting a hold of their hearts early on in life and never losing my grip.
That's the, those are the words of a wise mother. My brother, my sister, and I, we've been greatly benefited from the mother that raised us and cared for us and still cares for us. She still prays for us. But uh, Charles Spurgeon once said, I cannot tell you how much I owe to the solemn work, excuse me, the solemn word of my good mother. Very succinct. So a godly mother not only has hands that are working and a mouth that is speaking, but thirdly, let me say this. She has a heart that is loving. A heart that is loving. Proverbs 31, verses 11 and 12 tell us, The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of his life. Excuse me, all the days of her life. One of the best things a child can have growing up are, are two parents, father and mother, who are of the same mind to raise those children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to become uh, clean, decent, respectable members of society, productive members of society once they finally do grow up. As I said earlier before our preaching time, if you had a very... Uh, mindful and a wise and a loving and a caring mother uh, who watched after you and wanted the best for you, wanted you to, to amount to something, whether she was a believer or not a believer, you have a lot to be thankful for. A husband who has complete trust in his wife knows that she loves him. And that's the way it ought to be. I've always felt bad for ladies who had to be both father and mother because there was no father in the picture. I empathize with uh, ladies, especially Christian ladies, in that, those set of circumstances. It's not ideal. Certainly not what the, um, the mother would desire. It's not fair for her to have to pick up the slack and be a, a, a manly influence when she's not a man to children, especially if she's got boys to raise. You know, uh, I'm going to get off the subject and talk about father's subject right now, but when a, uh, a young man grows up thinking he can take liberties with young ladies, girls he's interested in, he wants to go out on a date with, or some such thing, and I think, well, no harm, no foul. I mean, nobody finds out about it. You know, it's just her and me. Nobody's going to tell anybody. I'm certainly not going to tell anybody. And he thinks he can go as far as he can go with some other person's daughter. But he grows up, and he has any good sense. He realizes he wouldn't want someone treating his daughter that way. And if he looks back, with any clarity, he realized how ashamed he ought to be for how he conducted himself when he was young. And he wouldn't want his son to treat somebody else's daughter that way. A young man learns how he ought to treat a young lady by watching his father's example. And a young lady ought to grow up knowing what she has the right to expect because her father set a good example. She shouldn't settle for anything less. That's why I say I empathize with ladies who have to be both father and mother to their children. That's not the ideal situation. And I, I commend those who have lost their mothers for still staying strong in the Lord Jesus Christ, not giving up on God, understanding that the loss of a loved one, uh, the loss of a parent, father, mother, is a natural part of our living. That's the natural end of everyone. We all know it's going to come. We just pretend like it's not going to come. And so that's why I said earlier, if you still have a father and mother living, you ought to be very, very thankful to God for it and appreciative of it and let them know how much you care. Let them know how much you love them and admire and appreciate all that they do for you. 
um, you know, children need to see those things modeled uh, in the lives of their father and their mother. They need to see the kind of Christian virtue and uh, godliness that a, a, a godly mother can demonstrate before them. The way she treats her husband, loves her husband, loves her children, cares for their needs, and see a man that's not a lazy bum, uh, and he's mindful of setting a good example as well. But I think um, mothers deserve much more praise than once a year. That, that much should be a uh, given. Charlie Chaplin said, It seemed to me um, that my mother was the most splendid woman I ever met. I have met a lot of people knocking around the world since, but I have never met a more uh, thorough, excuse me, thoroughly refined woman than my mother. If I have amounted to anything, it will be due to her. And our First President George Washington spoke about his mother, and he said this, My mother was the most beautiful woman I ever saw. I guess he never saw my mother. <laughs> all I am, I owe to my mother. I attribute all my success in life to the moral, intellectual, physical education I received from her. The actor Denzel Washington, he said about his mother, My mother never gave up on me. I messed up in school so much that they were sending me home. But my mother would send me right back again. If you, tried to, if you had a mother who tried to be a good moral example, she wanted you to be productive, she wanted you to amount to something uh, profitable in life, then you have much to be thankful for. Dr. Ruckman, who's so influential on so many of us, and yeah, you know, I was talking to my father the other day, Dr. Ruckman single-handedly kept the issue of the King James Bible alive in the world. When fundamentalists all over the country were abandoning it, preaching from it, but then secretly saying, there are mistakes in it, the ASV is better, the NIV is better, and so forth. And he steered many of them back to the King James Bible only, uh, as they should have been. And he being dead, yet speaketh. But in his testimony, he said, I learned to drink watching my mother drink. I learned to smoke watching her smoke. I learned to gamble watching my mother play cards. And when she died, there's no indication that she was ever a believer. His children were small, and one said, Daddy is grandma in hell. Yeah, honey, she's in hell. Is she burning, Daddy? She's burning. What a terrible thing to have to say because you didn't have the mother you should have had. But I try to bring this to a conclusion today. Thomas Edison, the great inventor, said, I did not have my mother long, but she cast over me an influence which has lasted all my life. The good effect of her early training I can never lose. If I have, excuse me, <clears throat> if it had not been for her uh, appreciation and her faith in me at a critical time, in my experience, I should never likely have become an inventor. I will always, uh, I was always a careless boy, and with a mother of a different temperament, a different caliber, I should have turned out badly. But her firmness, her sweetness, her goodness were potent powers to keep me in the right path. My mother was the making of me. The memory of her will always be a blessing to me. You know, nobody's mom was nearly as blessed as your own mom. 
And if you had a mother that you can say, thank God for the mother I had, or the mother I still have, then you've been doubly blessed, triply blessed, 